absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Redmond, um, our speaker for tonight. So Jennifer is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Maynooth University. And she lectures there on Irish social history, on gender history, on political history, demographic history, um, on probably absolutely anything. Um, she's published in these areas, including her absolutely fantastic um, monograph, which is called Moving Histories, Irish Women's Migration to Britain from Independence to the Republic. Um, and that's published by Liverpool University Press in 2018. So I'm not going to mention all of her accolades because I know we're really eager to, to hear from Jennifer, but just um, a couple, she's vice chair of the Royal Irish Academy Historical Studies Committee. Um, she's a fellow of the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies. She sits on the editorial board um, of the internationally renowned uh, Women's History Review. Um, and more recently, she was appointed an editor of the documents on Irish foreign policy. So she's going to, us, to speak to us this evening. You can see there on neutrals, immigrants, aliens, evacuees, the Irish in Britain during the Second World War. So we're going to hear from Jennifer first, and then we're going to take questions either in the chat or verbally at the end. So you're welcome to put your questions in the chat um, as we go along, or um, when we come to the end, I will ask for um, some digital hands. So I'll pass over now to Jennifer. Thank you uh, for the really warm welcome and introduction. Thanks to the society generally for inviting me to speak. Um, this is a really great honor because actually you're allowing me into your homes through this Zoom link. So I'm, I'm really honored about that. And thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Um, special thanks to Andrew and Dara, particularly for their persistence in making this happen. And of course, to Elaine for chairing this session. Um, I'm really grateful to Prony for making this whole thing possible. It's actually one of my favorite places to be in Belfast. So I'm, I'm kind of sad I'm not there with all of you, but this is a very good alternative um, indeed. So I'll get to my paper. Um, this paper is based on research I completed. I put it on Twitter many moons ago. It was um, for an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship that I held between 2009 and 2011 um, at Maynooth and um, Professor Jackie Hill was my mentor at the time and I now actually work there and um, that was a lifetime ago but uh, the project was based on over 23,000 individual records so you might understand why I'm still actually working on it. Um, the project was for two years, as I said, and I examined the application forms that Irish people who were living in Britain during the Second World War filled out to obtain a travel permit. So as usual, when I'm speaking about this research, I'm going to explain what a travel permit was. And um, if you've heard me explain that before, I apologize. But if you haven't, then I have to explain it because otherwise what I'm talking about won't really um, make sense in terms of the nature of the sources. So I was lucky enough, um, with the help of Katrina Crow at the National Archives in Ireland, um, many of you probably know her, um, she's quite a renowned cultural commentator, um, and she allowed me um, special access to these records that were previously unutilised and unavailable to researchers. And they're from um, part of the Department of Foreign Affairs collection. And so I uh, created this project and I'm going to present to you um, because they're, they're quite a unique set of records. Mostly, as you all know, travel between the two islands wasn't regulated. You didn't actually need any kind of um, ID or permission, but the war made that um, uh, necessary. And as um, renowned migration historian and Delaney has outlined, as you see in this quote on the slide, I won't read it because you can read it while I'm talking, because of the national security needs that um, were caused both uh, by the IRA bombing campaign and also the war itself, particularly the fall of France, um, travel permits and ID had to, uh, had to happen. At certain times, people actually couldn't travel at all. And at all times, people had to have some form of identification on them. And Irish people who migrated during the war to take up war work in the main, um, they were regarded as this term conditionally landed aliens. And so permits uh, to travel were just part of the regulation of, about their stay in Britain. They had to kind of check in with the police and um, had to have permission to change jobs, all sorts of things. 
So they were compulsory, and um, this is one of the, the information sheets that people would have seen um, to when they were filling them out. And you had to also have an additional thing called an exit permit when returning from Britain. And you can see uh, a real one here, which is um, somebody filled these out. Now, thousands of these travel permits were issued from Dublin as people took up the chance to work in Britain. We have an estimate of about 100,000 uh, new wartime migrants. And uh, overall, they give us a picture of who, um, who was going and uh, in what years and what they were doing. And of course, they were also needed to come back. And those ones coming back is what I've particularly um, looked at. Now, certain people um, from ERA, as it was known at the time, weren't actually allowed to leave. And uh, this sounds somewhat familiar, frontline workers, right? So people who were particularly um, involved in turf cutting, food production, um, because the island had to become more self-sufficient, there was a worry that too many of those would migrate to better paying jobs in Britain. So they were um, prohibited along with um, uh, quite young people. And up to the age of 16, children traveled on their parents' permit or that of another adult. So I found evidence of children being um, brought by neighbours, relations, people in their, their family, their kin network, etc. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in, in a while. Now, as you can see in this slide, um, if you were going to be recruited to one of these um, labour schemes, as they were often known, or group schemes, um, this was for uh, war work and you were recruited di directly from air. It took days and days. And this is an experience that some people kind of ranted about in letters that went along with their applications. And you can kind of understand, we all get annoyed when we have to fill out forms with long um, categories and loads of personal information. And if that was the first time you ever had to do that, because mostly people didn't, um, or if you were in a real hurry to, to um, travel because of the war, and I'll be talking about cases that, that really were like that, um, and that you, you know, you wouldn't have necessarily even had your photograph taken very regularly. Those are all sort of bewildering and stressful experiences that we kind of take for granted. And it's just a whole new level of bureaucracy, which uh, brought the official neutrality of Ireland and the battle lines of Britain into stark relief. So what you ended up with after navigating that system was one of these. And I should explain that I am um, I'm specifically marked in this image that I have permission to show it. And this is because it came to me through a student who I was teaching back in 2009, who realized that his family had one of these and it belonged to his grandmother. And I was lucky enough to be able to, to copy it and to use it in my book and of course in this presentation. Now the files in the National Archives of Ireland are not open as they have some concerns over the data protection issues about personal information that is uh, that could be broadcast about people who might still be alive. If you're very young at this point, you, you might still be alive. So this means that I'll be giving you examples um, from other repositories or showing you redacted applications. Now, I do have plans to revisit this project because it's a huge project with the ultimate aim of digitizing the files and opening them all up and hopefully you'll be able to, to search them. But this is going to require um, time and funding and very careful navigation of the laws on data protection. And all of this would become easier once um, the files are 100 years old, uh, but that's not for another 20 years in most cases. So I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that in the questions if you want. One point though, that's noteworthy is that different repositories treat the same documents and the same information in different ways. So this is an example from the National Archives of the UK, thank you. And it's freely available to researchers and is exactly what I just showed you, an Irish travel permit. It also speaks to uh, the direct recruitment of women from ERA into government labor, labor schemes in Britain, as does this one. And as you can see, what I've highlighted here is that one of the things that this research throws up is a little bit extra information about women. And so we can see that this woman is married 
And this is noteworthy because in the contemporary context for women in air, there was a marriage ban for women in the civil service and in primary schools that was copied, although there was absolutely no legal basis for it or a requirement for it uh, by the private sector. So this is undoubtedly one of the great attractions of, of Britain for married women who either needed or wanted to work. Now, I'm actually uncertain if PRONI holds any similar records relating to travel permits, but it would be an interesting area for study and is part of my future agenda, which is getting longer by the minute, uh, for this research, because there was a Belfast uh, office. I have seen a Belfast issued travel permit because you had to surrender your old one to get a new one, just like you do your passport now. So the information contained in all these 23,000 and more files has allowed me to create a really rich demographic profile, what we might call a prosopography, of both men and women who were crossing the sea at this point. And these are the kinds of um, things that I was recording. Now, out of the 23,040 travel permit applications that I analysed, over two thirds or 15,252 were from women. And that's reflecting their greater propensity to be involved in the evacuation of children, which I'm going to talk about more, um, and the greater numbers of women who were not working outside the home. And then, you know, they were free to travel more easily. But you do also see um, women workers like nurses who were actually paid uh, for their vacation and their, their travel was paid for as a way to kind of help them not burn out because the, the war was such an intense period where they were working quite a lot. So women are cropping up for a couple of different reasons. Now, the forms also asked, these are the things that I recorded, that's on the slide, but the forms also asked about physical features like height and eye colour but I didn't systematically record that information. I had to kind of narrow down the project a bit or it would have taken me much longer. It was quite amusing though, to see how people answered the question as to their face. Um, I think it was meant to prompt answers like it's round or it's oval shaped, but people, um, both men and women wrote things like fresh or pale or rosy. Um, so that was fun to look at how people uh, reacted to that question. This project, though, when I realised I couldn't record everything and what would I record, um, it made me realise quite vividly that any pretense at objectivity by historians is really kind of farcical, because even the kind of questions that we think uh, to ask of our research are subjective. So I'll give you an example. I had very quickly examined a sample box of the files when preparing my application for the project, and none that I happened to look at that day mentioned children. But on the very first day when I received the first box uh, of files after I successfully won the funding, what did I see? I see a Cork man bringing his six children home from Dagenham, ranging in age from six years to five months. And an interesting by note, some of you might know that Dagenham and Cork both have um, Ford car plants. So that's not what this man was doing, but um, possibly how the connection was made. So now that I have children myself, I think I actually might have initially thought about children before starting the project. But at that point, I didn't. And so I didn't. Anyway, um, back to this talk. So intending passengers, they needed to give a reason as to why they were traveling. And so many people evacuating children, just like this quirk man, or going to visit children already evacuated are revealed. Now, I found Irish people um, residing all over the British Isles, as this slide shows you. Um, literally everywhere, all the islands, everything. And um, I'm going to highlight um, some specific stories from Ulster migrants. But there's an important part of this research that it's necessary to highlight. So at one level, these applications are just for, you know, piece of paper, uh, what's the big deal to show authorities along uh, your journey simple form of ID that we all now have multiple versions of in our wallets. But at another level, these could be profound expressions of identity or alternatively, very practical reactions to a worldwide war in which invasion by Germany may have seemed possible at any moment. So everyone, apart from men in the armed forces, had to have a travel permit to sail into or from Britain. And different permits, as I've said, were issued from Northern Ireland and ERA and Britain. 
So this example is uh, one that was issued from Britain. It's a blue color. And again, it's held by the National Archives at Kew. And it's for a Belfast consultant surgeon, Dr. Alfreda Baker. Here she is. And um, as you can see, she was living in St. Albans. So she's uh, applying for this type of a permit. But other people chose to travel from, from to going back to Northern Ireland on era permits. So this is um, the data I collected on counties of birth. And I found a really great spread of people from all over um, the island of Ireland and not no one county uh, predominated. There's kind of a sprinkling from each one. And many of them came from Northern Ireland, as you can see here, 579 in total. Now, I don't know why people from one of these counties might choose to apply uh, to for a permit uh, from ERA instead of Britain. It could be for very practical reasons, such as they had the choice of either uh, one of the offices and one happened to be closer or more convenient for them for wherever they were living in the UK. It could be that they held views about their nationality that they wanted their official ID uh, to express. It could be that they felt safer traveling with ID from a neutral country if something were to happen and their journeys were intercepted by an Axis power. Unfortunately, this is all conjecture. We just don't know as the forms don't require an applicant to explain that. But it is interesting and is again part of my long agenda for going back and, and looking again at these sources. See, can I ferret out any information there? One thing is certain though, and that is the major focus of this talk. The island of Ireland, and particularly ERA, was viewed as a safe haven for pregnant women, children, and families in general. A fact that appears to have been widely understood at the time of the Second World War, but subsequently forgotten. So that brings me to evacuation stories. So the official evacuation scheme, many of you will know this, it began straight away at the beginning of the war, the 1st of September, 1939. And it moved 1,473,000 children and adults from the crowded cities of Britain, motivated by propaganda, such as you see on the screen. Now, most of them are women and children, mothers and children, and they were transferred to what were called reception areas before war was declared two days later on the 3rd of September, 1939. And a second wave of evacuations took place because actually many people got bored and came back. Um, uh, so a second round happened um, from London in September of 1940, and that saw 1,250,000 adults and children moved. And then there was a third wave um, from London in July of 1944. So my data that I have mainly captures the second wave of that evacuation process. I'm really interested in my research in comparing and contrasting the ways in which British wartime children have been remembered, commemorated and indeed celebrated in comparison to the almost complete silence about uh, children um, from or going to Ireland. The contrasts go further though because this silence is not reflected in contemporary newspaper depictions of um, Irish evacuees from wartime Britain, which I'm going to show you later. So that makes the absence in historiography and public memory of the Second World War or the emergency, as it was known in neutral Ireland, even more startling. And I use that word very deliberately. It was quite startling to me when I discovered this particular angle of my research on this um, experiences of the Irish in 20th century Britain. So while the wide scale evacuation of children in Britain has been fairly well sketched in historical studies and literature and film genres, there's so many memoirs about it, for example. This is just one of the iconic images you will have all be familiar with these kinds of things. Um, the evacuation of Irish born children or second generation Irish children or um, British children who came to Ireland is less well known. And yet they were actually part of the official evacuation schemes, as well as engaging in private evacuation. Indeed, most of the people that I examined in this research were in London and they were in urban areas like that. So they, they and these children experienced the same horrors of bombing, rationing and deprivations that went along with, with wartime. 
They may also have had parents directly involved in the British war effort. We know um, Irish men and women served in um, the armed forces. Um, lots of people from the island of Ireland uh, were engaged in direct uh, home warfront efforts. And yet there's like a really strange silence that hangs over their experiences. So as I researched images um, for this presentation from many well-known sites, I wondered, are there any Irish faces in there? I've argued in an article I've written on this history, and I'm going to expand on this argument today, but examining the history of Irish evacuees reveals that it was only actually in the post-war period that they became invisible. And this is connected to wider beliefs, dearly cherished in some quarters, that the war allowed independent Ireland to assert itself on the national stage as standing apart from Britain. The previous held assumption of Ireland's Plato's cave, as um, the historian FSL Lyons called it, which was the theory that Ireland kind of isolated uh, from the war and its impact emerged in the aftermath blinking in disbelief. That, that theory has been widely discredited. Many historians have detailed the interaction between the two governments and contributions of volunteer soldiers and female auxiliaries, because remember there was no conscription, all of which demonstrate an interconnected, politically sensitive policy understood as a pro-allied form of benevolent neutrality. This has undermined nationalist definitions of Ireland as defining its independence by neutrality, and it stands in contrast also to understandings of the war as being, quote, a high watermark of Britishness, according to historian Wendy Ugolini. If significant mi uh, minorities of its civilian and soldiering populations were not in fact British. War was a hard hitting reality for thousands of Irish emigrants, including children, and they were directly targeted by uh, schemes such as on the slide. So here are the facts as I know them from this research. I have uh, 2,168 boys, 2,137 girls and 76 children whose gender was not stated. They didn't fill out the forms correctly to, to let the officers know. And there wasn't the kind of quibbling about bureaucracy, it seems, to, to make them state that. So that makes for a total of 4,378. And that's for the period just between 1940 and 1942 thereabouts. That's where the largest cluster of the forms come from. And I can, I can talk more about why in the questions if you'd like. So within this group uh, were the applications of children who were attempted to be brought to Ireland by English um, citizens who were actually refused permits because they should be traveling on a British um, permit. This suggests second or subsequent generations of Irish in Britain utilizing important family networks to get their children to safety. Now, children ranged um, from one week old, which is a detail I find horrifying and compelling, knowing how stressful and difficult it is to have a one week old, let alone trying to travel with them in a time of war, up to, as I've said, the age limit of 15 years. The large nature of Irish families is attested to in some of the forms, such as, for example, Mr. F, a 33 year old man who was bringing a family um, consisting of a one, two, eight, 11 and 12 year old who's traveling from Berkshire to Dublin. Crucially, his reason for the permit is to accompany his family, suggesting that that's not concrete, that he will be returning to England. The average number of children being brought back was 3.3. So smaller than Mr. F's five children, but of course that's an average. There's both more and less than that. Now you can see in this table, there's a real range of reasons um, given for return on the permit forms and many related directly to um, evacuation. Now these were not holidays, although many were returning for that reason. They were flights from bombs, visits to evacuated children or journeys to ensure their safety. Table one demonstrates a very complex nexus of care being provided for Irish children. As might be expected, given gendered care roles, women were more likely than men to be evacuating their children. So there's 383 female applicants versus 42 male. Although this information is partial, it is likely that such trends continued with the pattern of men returning temporarily to Ireland to visit wives and children when conditions allowed and pregnant women and children returning to avoid the war. This evidence is unique in affording insights 
into Irish people's reactions to the war and their negotiation of childcare arrangements. And furthermore, 625 women, that's 2.7%, claimed to be traveling solely because they were pregnant, a time of worry for many women, but especially so in the context of war, as this slide relating to a Cavan woman's um, application demonstrates. She just wanted to be amongst her own people. She was about to have a baby. Or we have another case. Um, this woman has one-year-old twin boys and a two and a three-year-old, and she's pregnant again, and her town has been evacuated. This is Mrs. H, as I'm calling her. She's from a small town in Kildare. She's married to a British man. And she detailed her reason for leaving Rye in Sussex, as you might be able to read her writing, leaving evacuated town for refuge and forthcoming confinement at home. Mrs. H and her family had been experiencing significant enemy action. So even though the form doesn't tell me this, I was able to check her area. On August 12th, 1940, six weeks before her application, the station for detecting low-flying aircraft had been hit by a German plane led by Hauptmann Walter Rubensdorfer. Further attacks came on August 15th, with German bomber, bomber planes cutting electricity in Rye and Dover. The uncertainty and fear generated by such attacks undoubtedly played a part in Mrs. H's return to her native town with her four children. Indeed, details are revealed on many forms of what's called nervous strain, tension, insomnia, and fear in personal statements explaining the applicant's desire to return, including statements saying that their children had become very scared of air raids. Now, it would be really fascinating if more psychological studies of trauma were available to us that took ethnicity into account, because people did study this after the war. But it is undoubtedly true that Irish children living in wartime Britain were affected by bombings. We see other cases where women <clears throat> excuse me, uh, return to Ireland to leave children, including this one, which I was able to identify from other parts of the application, um, was an unmarried mother who was leaving her eight month old female child um, with her parents. Now, this uh, was replicated um, back uh, in, in lots and lots of cases that I saw actually. Um, and I noted that married Irish women, like their British counterparts, often moved their children to safety, but remained themselves in Britain as housewives while their husbands worked. So this appears to be the case of a Mrs. P, a 20 year old mother of one from Donegal. I was able to see that she went over to Britain as a milling machinist in 1939. But by August of 1941, she was a housewife and was returning to her parents for a holiday to leave her child with them. Now, to modern eyes, this might seem a bit strange. If the mother was not working, why would she not stay with the child or keep the child with her? I think, however, it reflects the contemporary closeness of families, whereby care given by a grandparent was viewed as equal to that that would have been given by a parent, and that the child, in this case, was safer in Donegal, and also the idea that men working hard during the war effort needed women to be on home duties, as it was called. It's clear from the evidence I have gathered then that Irish people, at least many thousands of them, were fully immersed in the war experience. A point I stress because sometimes the historiography of the period would appear to suggest that the Irish people who were there were just simply there to work as economic migrants somehow untouched by the realities on the horrors of war because it was not an Irish war. It seems that the safe haven offered by evacuation to Ireland was preferable to keeping children in Britain, even if the length of separation could not be known. And this was eased, I would imagine, by the relative ease with which travel could be undertaken for most of the war. But the uncertainties of the conflict actually always posed the risk that contact could be cut off um, completely or indefinitely. But this type of evacuation was most likely encouraged, as I noted on the slide earlier, because it eased the burden on the British government to place these women and children, and it was also cheaper. They were paid half the rate for women and children going to Ireland than they did if they were built in Britain. Other examples, um, such on, as on this slide, confirm that Irish people were living in dangerous places sometimes, and were experiencing all kinds of tragic situations during the war, 
or that they really wanted to see the children who uh, already had been uh, um, evacuated. That last one, um, that the house next door was bombed on husband on, on night work, I feel doesn't kind of give the whole story. She's clearly very nervous. Historian John Welshman, among others, has evoked the myriad problems encountered by mothers and children who were evacuated from the major towns and cities in, Brist in Britain, including a hostile reception from locals, exaggerated reports of lice and skin diseases, and derogatory depictions of the manners and hygiene of city dwellers. There was also the strangeness of the countryside to deal with for many. So you see that commented upon in a lot of memoirs, how, how strange it was to see so much countryside. I'm speculating, though, that it's likely that if Irish children were evacuated by themselves to places in Britain, they would have had a very different experience, as many of them would have been born or regularly visited the rural areas that their parents came from. And even if they weren't from a rural area, say they were from Dublin, they may have traveled, traveled once or twice a year on trains and ships. So that experience, which is often narrated as kind of new and exciting, that wouldn't have been new to them. They may even have had ex the experience of being away from their parents for long periods before if they had lived in households where, where either parent engaged in seasonal migration or, as uh, some of the examples I've given to you before, they'd been brought to Ireland for summer holidays or away from one or both of their parents. That's all very common um, kind of features of, of Irish migration. However, one of the crucial differences of being evacuated to elsewhere in Britain, as opposed to returning to Ireland, was that in the former case, the British authorities at least guaranteed food, board, and access to provisions such as winter clothes and boots for the most needy in certain areas. The scheme for evacuating uh, women and children to Ireland was undertaken on the condition that the women, if returning, would not become a liability to the Irish state, but they also had to promise to stay there. So this was either not understood completely by some of the women who evacuated with their children or else was regarded as a flexible rule. The case of a Mrs. F in Mayo illustrates this well. On arriving in Ireland in February 1941, she immediately applied for home assistance on reaching her father-in-law's house in the town of Mayo on the basis that she had been receiving home assistance in Liverpool as her husband was unable to work due to poor health and she'd been told that she could get the same kind of thing in Ireland. On receiving notice of the application from the Mayo Board of Health and Public Assistance, the Secretary of the Department of Local Government of Public Health wrote a curt reply refuting her claims, which actually had been approved by the Mayo Board, by stating that it would be a condition of the scheme that the mother's concerns would undertake to maintain themselves and their children, and that applications would not be accepted from mothers unable to do so. And the assistance was basically only meant to kick in if they became destitute after arrival in Ireland. They couldn't just turn up destitute. They actually went so far in the department as to investigate with the British Ministry of Health who told her she was going to get help. And that investigation found she had been wrongly informed. But because of uh, this error, the British Ministry of Health told them that they would undertake to cover the cost of her assistance. So they were paying. Mrs F's children ranged from two to 14 years of age. And the documentation, I, I can't share it with you, but it reveals a, a, a bit about her life. She was on uh, public assistance in Liverpool. She was living in a very crowded conditions. She goes home to a safe area to her father-in-law's house, but again, low, very low levels of state welfare. So what this and other correspondence reveals is a certain incongruity in the relationship between Britain and Ireland. The intertwined and dependent relationship of the two countries is revealed through this evacuation of women and children, with the British government undertaking the administrative and financial responsibility of delivering citizens of a neutral country to their homeland and maintaining them whilst there. It is important to note that Irish persons who evacuated themselves and their children from designated evacuation areas on their own initiative, so not part of the official schemes, they did actually receive some assistance to do so. And I think many people I've identified, even if they don't say they're part of a scheme or they're not, I think that they availed of some help. 
For those evacuating privately, the British government provided free travel vouchers and a lodging allowance to be paid to the homeowner they were going to. So that could be a family member, their parents, their, their brother, their sister. And that had to be arranged by the person themselves, but the, the government, the British government would pay. So there was a lodging allowance of five shillings per mother and the same for children 14 years and over, with three shillings per week being allowed for children under 14 years of age. So just to reiterate, the British government were paying for Irish people, including for children who may or may not have been born in Britain, to evacuate and to maintain them while they stayed with family. That was a rather surprising finding for me and one that not only complicates the neutrality story further, but is a detail um, indicative of a practicality in the whole matter. It was actually cheaper to do this than to evacuate um, these people internally in Britain as the maintenance costs were much higher. And undoubtedly it was safer because sometimes they moved people to areas and then had to move them on. The Irish government had uh, a few more than financial concerns at heart when it came to these evacuated children. It also had some health concerns. Uh, they don't come across very well in this history, I'm, I'm very well aware, um, in what can only be seen as a fear of contamination. So the Department of Health urged that the local medical superintendent officer of health should be informed of the arrangements so that, quote, he may be in a position to arrange where necessary for a family being kept under observation for a period and to take any other measures which he may deem desirable in the interests of public health. So the reference to public health here appears to allude to the issue of the poor health and hygiene, supposedly, of many urban evacuees. And some, but of course not all, appear to uh, suffer from poor living standards and uh, were accused of having problems such as lice, fleas and skin diseases. Incidentally, Irish people going to Britain were also accused of having all of those things. So they were accused of going and coming back. This observation, well, perhaps very practical from a point of view of a health management system is not particularly sensitive. And in fact, the Irish government had complained bitterly uh, when the British government were making noises about that. This kind of evacuation was also not secret. You can find ample evidence of it in the newspapers. So this newspaper article from 1940 describes experiences in a Sussex village where clearly the inhabitants had been dreading the influx of London school children. But here we see that one London Irish girl, as she's called, had become a firm favourite, Pauline Donovan. Here, we see the Irish Times reporting on negotiations between ERA and the British governments to house evacuees as it was actually discussed in the House of Commons. In the winter of 1940, it seems that the Irish Red Cross were leading the way. And again, that's in the newspapers. And they were assisting evacuees coming off the boats from England. Um, very often with the weather or there were certain security concerns, um, they might not be exactly sure when they would dock. So they would be there to meet them, to provide them with blankets and hot drinks, to make sure that they got where they needed to go. Um, and they were particularly um, worried about the children. So this is all very much known about. By January of 1941, we see about 3,000 evacuees um, coming from, to Ireland in the first month that this particular scheme was advertised, which according to this article was roughly equally divided between those going to destinations north and south of the border. But beyond the government schemes, there were some entrepreneurial citizens who realized the attractiveness of locations in neutral air and were advertising accommodation to families, as you can see here, as well as the first advertisement there, desperate families looking for suitable places to send their children to safety. So we have a very mixed history of some seeking evacuees and making some money off this, those using family and kin networks to get support, and others who frankly dreaded the prospect of hosting evacuees. Which brings me to the last segment of the talk, which is related to Belfast itself, as it would be remiss of me not to mention the bombing of this city in a talk in which I'm virtually hosted by it. So the story of the Belfast Blitz is likely very well known to you as it caused such devastation. 
In the course of four Luftwaffe attacks on the nights of the 7th to 8th of April, the 15th to 16th of April, the 4th to 5th of May, and the 5th and the 6th of May 1941, lasting 10 hours in total, 1,100 people died. Over 56,000 houses in the city were damaged, which was about half its housing stock entirely, and roughly 100,000 made temporary homeless with 20 million pounds damage caused to property at wartime values. And can you imagine if you had come home from Britain thinking that you were safe in Belfast and then this happens, it must have been devastating. Now, not all the displaced people could be accommodated in the city, of course, and so evacuation to other areas was necessary, which is where we get some similar stories. Uh, this was not a wholly welcome development as this newspaper shows us the Ulster Herald. Um, it's the same fears, the same annoyances, the same negative perceptions of Londoners going to Sussex are found here about Belfast residents going to Enniskillen. And this isn't a unique article in, in case you think I dredged up the one that found uh, this viewpoint. Here they are talked about in terms of a biblical plague. That's from the Belfast Telegraph in July of 1941. And some of the concern came simply from local resources being completely overwhelmed. So here it states that in Enniskillen, they think they can comfortably accommodate 80, but they're having to deal with 145. So that's obviously a stretch for any small um, amount of resources. Now, this isn't a comprehensive account of uh, Belfast evacuation as I pulled together this element just for this talk, but I wanted to demonstrate the widespread and shared experience of evacuation in Britain, Northern Ireland and ERA during the Second World War. So I'm going to get to some conclusions now and I'm looking forward to some questions and comments from you. From doing this research, it seems to me that the lives, experiences and deaths of Irish people working in Britain during the Second World War have been largely forgotten when it comes to writing histories of the war from both British and Irish perspectives. The subsequent question remains why. The political sensitivities around the neutrality of the 26 counties is an obvious explanation, but I think it goes deeper than that. The collective cultural amnesia about how the, how the Ireland island of Ireland was widely and publicly used as an expanded evacuation zone has persisted for a long time. Sorry, I think I went up there. The travel permit applications confirm that not only were Irish uh, people evacuating their children due to their own desires, but they were participating in the official British evacuation scheme. How many children this affected, how long they stayed in Ireland or Northern Ireland away from their parents, and what their profile was are a few of the questions that remain to be answered, but I do intend to keep working on this area. John Welshman, in his sensitive exploration of the experience of evacuation, asked some questions which are pertinent to the children who came to Ireland. What was it like to be sent away? Did evacuation permanently alter relationships with brothers and sisters and between children and parents? How did children feel? when they finally returned home? And what was the significance of love and separation for the children's subsequent lives? They can all easily apply to the cases of children who came to Ireland or Northern Ireland, but they may have different answers considering our histories of migration. It's a really common occurrence. And it one that it might've actually helped the children cope with separation. One further question to be added to Welshman's list might be, was a child's nationality taken into consideration and did it make any difference to the experience of evacuation? And does nationality have any part to play in why they are forgotten in the collective memory that exists about the war? These cases merely touch upon the many examples I've collected of Irish people in Britain wishing to evacuate themselves or their children to the safety of neutral Ireland. The fact that many were administratively and financially assisted to do so by the British government shows both the humanitarian care taken by that government and the rather complex relationship that existed between the Irish and British administrations at this tense time. What is necessary to be able to understand the questions I have raised is more research into this area, not just to capture their experiences, although I would love to do that and is important but also to examine the conceptualization of immigrant children 
within the context of the cultural imagination of the war, as we've seen over and over again in the kind of pictures and memoirs and films, which has made the evacuation of children take on a kind of iconic status over the years. The People's War, as it's often referred to, was also a children's war. And children from Ireland were undeniably a part of it, if a forgotten one so far. So thank you very much for listening. I've put my email up there and I'll, I'll leave that up there in case anyone wants to contact me further after this. So thank you so much.